Hey guys, so I just want to come by and tell you about my most recent webinar on interview preparation for the IMG. Um, it's a 60 minute webinar with additional information as to how you can make yourself sound good and create likability during an interview. You can find it at imgroadmap.com slash P slash interview prep. The link is in the description box. The IMG Roadmap is the only podcast dedicated to coaching international medical graduates and success blueprints for this unique pathway. I am Dr. Nina Loom, your host, a previous IMG turned hospital medicine physician, healthcare administrator, speaker, and coach. I empower, encourage, and equip you with actionable steps that you can take towards the residency position of your dreams. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the IMG Roma podcast. Today's guest is Dr. McSurdy. She's a newly minted MD. Welcome to the show, Dr. Caitlin. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing perfectly well. I'm so thankful. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, absolutely. So I am a U.S. born IMG, uh, originally born and raised in Northeastern Pennsylvania. I went to Temple University to do my undergrad and got my bachelor's of biology in 2015. I did go to medical school at St. George's University after two application cycles of applying to schools in the United States, and I did not get into U.S. schools either time. I did take a gap year, and I did some uh, clinical research for cardiology, and then recently I matched into internal medicine at Temple University Hospital, so that's where we're at right now. Awesome. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you. So you'll be starting PGY1 this month at Temple yes. University in internal medicine. Wow. Yes. Next week, actually. Yes. That's amazing. Congrats. How do you feel right now? Honestly, I'm pretty nervous. I'm not going to lie. I haven't been in a hospital since March because rotations were suspended. So I think that has me feeling pretty nervous. Yeah. But how do you feel about sort of being at the end of the journey and the last four years, and especially the fact that to get to this point, it took you two cycles of applying into U.S. medical schools, not getting in, doing a gap year before going to Grenada. How do you feel walking into that same outcome? Because this is where you wanted to be, right? You just thought you yeah. could do this through a U.S. school, it didn't work out, you went to the Caribbean, and now you're still walking into your dreams, so to speak, even though it's scary. But how does that feel to accomplish something so great? It is an incredible sensation, honestly. I think it was even more helpful that we just had our graduation this past weekend because the feeling of fulfillment and excitement was just as much as it would have been, I feel like, if we had an in-person graduation opposed to the virtual one we had. So I think that really did help me excite like it started to excite me a lot more for, you know, the upcoming journey I'm about to embark on. Embark on. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, and guys, you know, if you go to Instagram, you can find her at prescription fitness MD. She just posted her graduation pictures, which was just so adorable. And I think it's one <laughs> of the biggest motivation factors for anybody that's in this journey right now, kind of wondering about whether the end is going to come, when it's going to come, how it's going to come. When you look at other people's stories and you look at their pictures, I want that to serve as motivation for you to keep on keeping on. So Dr. McSurdy, can you tell us a little bit about your match journey? Yeah, sure. So I think my match journey honestly kind of goes back to when I was a kid. My family doctor actually had me very interested in medicine when I was younger. And I think it's a lot, a lot of, because I saw him as like a magic man, I had sports induced asthma and I was a track athlete in college. And so in high school, I was looking to go to college to run track and field. And obviously asthma and running don't go great together. So when he prescribed me some albuterol, which to him was probably nothing, to me, it was everything. So I just wanted to sort of be in his shoes where, you know, I gave people uh, those same type of lifestyle changes, I guess. And so then in undergrad, I started doing some shadowing. I shadowed a pediatrician. I shadowed an orthopedic surgeon just to kind of get my feet wet in a couple of different areas. And I actually went on a medical mission trip to Ghana also. And that was my favorite medical experience because it truly was primary care in its like truest form. And so that's where a lot of my interest in primary care started. But I didn't, when I got to medical school, I felt like I didn't have a lot of experience in other areas. So when I did my rotations, I kept my mind very open. And I did toy around with some other ideas like emergency medicine, OB even for a little bit. And ultimately, I, it kind of just came back to IM. I love the long-term care 
and just how much medicine you have to know. You have to know absolutely everything. So I applied to 120 places, went on a bunch of exhausting interviews, and then I wound up matching at my number one choice, which was amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. So just so the listeners get some background, you are, like you mentioned before, a U.S. citizen, but you attended St. George's University in the Caribbean in Grenada. And you yes, applied correct. to 120 programs. Can you tell us why you did that? Why that many? So for our school usually recommends applying to roughly 100 to 120 programs because that, I guess, with all of the data they collect and the step scores of all of the applicants for each cycle every year, I guess that's kind of the rough number they got for people to get those magical, you know, 12 to 15 interviews to secure you a residency. So I was erring on the side of caution and applying to those, you know, the higher end of the 100 to 120 programs, which now in retrospect, I do know is over applying, but I was just kind of given the advice I was taken because I didn't really have anyone to ask for help. Yeah. And I agree with Caribbean students considering more applications. I did about the same number. Maybe I did a hundred or so when I did apply. So the main reason I wanted to ask was really to affirm my decision when I recommend other IMGs to consider applying to more programs, because really what you're doing is you're casting a really wide net and you're increasing your chances of getting maybe a 10% return. So if you apply to 20 programs and you're thinking you're going to get a 10% return, that's not a whole lot of interviews, right? Yeah, if correct. If you apply to 120 and you get say 10%, which is like a really low end percentage, but you know, that can really amount to enough for you to be able to guarantee that you get ranked highly at one of them. So I really, I I think that the more IMGs apply into, the more numbers that they apply into, the better. But I don't recommend applying like 120 and then you apply to five specialties either. I do think that you pick one specialty and you maximize yourself within that specialty. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I actually went to a conference last year for internal medicine and they had a panel of program directors just for third and fourth year medical students to kind of ask and answer questions. And they kind of recommended the same thing. Just kind of apply as much as you can within that specialty. And if you do want to apply for a secondary specialty, then great. But applying to four or five is a little bit excessive. Yeah, it's an overkill. What conference was that? Because I know somebody's going to be asking in the comment section or sending an email to know. Can you share a little yeah, bit about what conference that was? So last year, the ACP had their 100th, I guess, anniversary conference conference in Philadelphia, because Philadelphia is ultimately where a lot of medicine in the United States began. So they held it in Philadelphia. And so that's where I attended. That's awesome. So what are your thoughts on medical students attending conferences? Since you brought that up, can you just tell us about why did you attend the conference and what have you learned from attending conferences and why do you recommend other students do the same? Or would you even recommend it? Yeah, so I think it's definitely a great experience if you know you can get to one. So I chose to go because Philadelphia is essentially my home city, I guess. And I don't know. I just like that stuff. I thought it would be interesting to go. I knew a few of my other classmates who were also interested in going because it was in close proximity to us, who those of us who were rotating in New York. And we were just, I guess, kind of trying to make connections. If anything, we knew there would be program directors there. We know ACP is very well known. And then also St. George's University has at the ACP conference every year, they have, I guess, like a meet and greet or like a mixer for SGU students to meet SGU alumni who are now either residents or attendings at other programs. And so I just thought it would be a good way to connect. So I do think that conferences are good to attend for a couple of reasons, making connections being one of them. I know ACP, in addition to having the SGU meet and greet, they also had ones a state dependent. So if you're like, you know, dead set on matching in Georgia, that you can attend the Georgia meet and greet and see if you need any program directors or residents with helpful information. And then the other thing is they actually have like sim lab sessions. So you can sign up to learn how to place a central line on the mannequins. You can learn how to do interosseous lines. There was chiro surgery and skin biopsies that you could do just to kind of, you know, start off, start getting some skills that necessarily you don't get on the wards um, because it is a little on the wards, you know, the residents or the interns are doing that. So I thought that was another great way to get some skills is by going to the conference. Right. I agree with that 100%. Like there's so many ways that students can utilize conferences to their advantage. 
One of them could be as a networking opportunity. Another could be an educational opportunity. And then, like you said, if you have specific requirements, it's really where you get focused networking at conferences. So, you know, some people listening, if they need some clarification, we're just going to say this. So St. George's is a Caribbean medical school. And what that means is the first years of medical school, which is the basic science years, are done on the island. In this case, for Dr. McSurdy, it was Grenada. And then the last two years of medical school are in the States at different hospitals. And that's where Dr. McSurdy stated she participated in rotations in the New York area. So let's come back to some really pertinent questions that we know a lot of IMGs have. They want to know about your test taking strategy for USMLE. They want advice on, you know, how to match into internal medicine, what scores, how did you study, what, you know, how do they go about that process? So let's talk about USMLE and any of your test taking tips. Yeah. So I took USMLE step one in July, 2018. And by far the most valuable resource is UWorld. UWorld is forgiving and telling you what you're bad at and what you're good at. So you will really get to know your strengths and your weaknesses by doing questions. The other thing I liked about UWorld is it, it, it's very similar to what the USMLE Step 1 exam looks like in terms of format, in terms of functions of the different buttons. Everything is just pretty much the same. So I think that's really great. And then also if you do the time blocks, it kind of simulates the blocks that are on the exam because it gives you the same amount of seconds per question. In terms of my study schedule, I know I get asked this a lot as well. I took the approach of doing two blocks of UWorld every morning and then reviewing those blocks. And by then it would be lunchtime. So I would take a lunch break. I used first aid and pathoma every afternoon. So what I did for these is I broke them each up by system. So if I was doing uh, cardiology, I would split the cardiology section of first aid up into two or three days. I think cardiology is a bigger section, so I split it up into three. Then pathoma, I would do the same thing. And so I would spend about two hours in the afternoon reviewing, kind of drilling the first aid concepts for each system. And then the same, the second two hours of the afternoon, I would do the same thing with pathoma. And then after that, I would take an hour and a half to two hours to do a short workout, get some dinner, shower, and just kind of decompress for a couple minutes. And then in the evening, I would do my micro biochem farm rotation. And this is another thing that I thought was really valuable because micro biochem and farm are so much memorization. And unfortunately, there are those things that if you look at them a million times, you'll remember them. And if you don't look at them, you're going to forget them. So my approach to this was I broke up micro biochem and farm each into seven sections. So for example, like day one, I would do gram positives for micro. Day two, I would do gram negatives for micro. For biochem, my day one would be like the Krebs cycle, glycolysis, and glycogen storage diseases or something like that. And so every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I was reviewing the same topic for micro, biochem, and farm. So I studied for about six to seven weeks. So I reviewed each section of micro, biochem, and farm six to seven times. So I thought this was a good way to combat forgetting all of the little nitty gritty details of micro, biochem, and farm. Wow. And then before bed, I would re review my smart book, which I made uh, from my UWorld question. So what's a smart book? So the way I think there's a couple different ways you can make a smart book. I thought the best approach for me was every time you get a U world question wrong, or if you get a question right by simply guessing, you read through the U world explanation and you sort of write down the reason you got the question wrong. For example, if it was just lack of knowledge, you could make a symbol or just write down, you know, lack of knowledge. And then you could write down like a phrase from the UWorld question, for example, if it was like increased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, and then next to it, you would write the correct answer. And then for some people, it helps if you like write a star underneath and just kind of go through the physiology or the pathophysiology to kind of make sure that you understand how all of that is working. So it's basically just the questions you got wrong and making sure those concepts you solidify before you take the exam. Wow, that's a good idea. I've never thought of that. I think it helps with creating a root cause analysis as to why you get the question incorrect so that that way you can learn the reason why and it makes it easier to learn the the exact, whether it's a knowledge deficit or whether it was a misunderstanding or whatever that causes, it helps with the learning process a lot better, I think. That's a really good tip. 
so for people that are interested in internal medicine, what do you have for tips as far as preparing for residency applications? So I would recommend, obviously, everyone drills step scores into your head. And it is unfortunate because I feel like the step one exam was never meant to stratify students. They, it was simply meant to, you know, say that you have the minimum amount of knowledge deemed necessary to be a functioning physician. And somehow we got into this stratification. And it's unfortunate, but that is what a lot of programs will filter by. So focus on your step scores if you can. If you didn't do so great on step one, you do always have step two. So focus on that. Programs do like to see a trend. And the other thing I recommend is having a well-rounded application. I think a lot of times, I know at least from a lot of the students I mentor, they focus on you know having to have this research and research and research. And on all of my internal medicine interviews, I was only ever asked about research on either one or two of them. It was a very small number of interviews that they even asked about my research. I think having a holistic application is a lot better. So if you can do some volunteer work, if you can do some community outreach, if you can, you know, get pretty good grades, and then if you can get really good letters of recommendation saying how hard you work in the clinical setting, I think that attests a lot more to you as a person and to how hard you work, opposed to just, you know, focusing on one specific area of your application. So I think having a well-rounded application is definitely the best tip I have. Yeah, I definitely agree with looking at the application from a 360 degree perspective. Scores may take up, you know, I don't know if I was to throw out a random number, 60% or 50%, but it really ma it makes a difference who's writing your letters of recommendations. It makes a difference what's in your personal statement. It makes a difference if you've done presentations or attended conferences or were student members of certain organizations or volunteered. So those things go a long way and do not disregard that portion of the application because of a great score. And on the flip side, even with a low score, you could still make up a lot for a lot of that with the other portion of your application. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you have any recommendations for securing interviews? I think applying smart would be my biggest tip for securing interviews. And what I mean by that is apply where you will be a competitive applicant. So I know we all have our dream programs. So yeah, I guess you can apply to a few. See if you get an interview, you know, there's Never say never, but also be realistic with yourself. Do your research. I think first and foremost, especially if you're an IMG, see what programs take your visa. Uh, because if they don't take your visa or if they're not going to sponsor your visa, I feel like it's not really even a great idea to apply because it's, I guess, a waste of an application in, in that sense. But the other thing is, if you go on free data, all, all of the programs show you the percentage of international medical graduates in their program. A lot of them are 25% or higher. So they're great programs to apply to. Some of them will be like 0.1% or 0.8%. And I feel like those are the ones that aren't really worth applying to because your application you know, would be, it would stand out better uh, elsewhere. So I think applying smart is definitely the best advice I have for securing interviews. I agree. I agree. Strategizing the application packet goes a long way. And that's Definitely. one of the things that, you know, I teach people when I coach them is you can apply to 50 programs with great strategy and still get interviews, right? Because you're applying Definitely. to places where you meet criteria, you're applying to locations where you have a higher likelihood of matching due to several other factors. And so it's really important that we're applying with strategy as opposed to just blanket you know, I'm just going to throw a bunch of things out there and expect some kind of return because really how much you're putting in on the front end and the energy, the time you're spending to research these programs and ensure eligibility, it always pays back as well. So I think that's, that was a really strong point that you raised there. So what are some other things that you have observed? Because going to medical school in the Caribbean, I get tons of DMs from students that are currently in different Caribbean schools, and they're just worried. They're worried about what they should be doing differently on the island, what they should be doing when they get to rotations. Do you have any tips, like just basic advice that you learned along the way about the best way to optimize your basic science years and your clinical years? Yeah, I think in basic science, the best thing you can do is focus on learning medicine because like I was just saying, step one is very important. I know now it's going to be going to pass fail. So obviously this will be a little less significant in the future, I think, but you still need to know a lot of step one information to build you, build your knowledge for step two. So I think 
focusing on school is the most important thing you can do in your basic science years. But this is also a really good time to get in some volunteer work because especially in the Caribbean, at least at SGU, there were plenty of opportunities to do community outreach. They had diabetes clinics. They had a lot of clinics through AMSA. I know they have one of the orphanage does beach days. You can reach out and you basically go to the beach and play with the kids and just spend a lot of time with them. And it's actually a lot of fun. It's very fulfilling. So just looking for community outreach, things like that is the really great thing to start doing in basic sciences as well. And if you need help, I know a lot of the professors, if you reach out to one of them and ask, most of them are affiliated with one of the community outreach organizations, and they can probably hook you up with someone who might an organization that might be looking for volunteers or might need a little extra help. So that's another really great thing to do in basic sciences. In terms of clinical sciences, make sure you do well on your shelves. It counts as step two preparation. And like I said, step two is also very important, arguably more important than step one nowadays and probably more so in the future. And just make sure you're working hard because your letters of recommendation, you want them to be strong. And I think a lot of people are okay with just kind of asking, you know, oh, I want to do internal medicine. So I'm just going to ask whoever I rotate with an internal medicine for a letter of recommendation. But you need to make yourself stand out because you want a strong letter. If if you're asking an attending who's never seen you and examine a patient for a letter of recommendation, it's probably not going to be a very strong letter of recommendation. So I think making sure you have good letters is the most important thing you can do in clinical years. Yeah, I definitely agree with that as well. There was something you mentioned before. I just want to touch on it a little bit. You said you did <laughs> interviews and during that time, only about two programs asked you about research. Can you tell us about the research that you did and how you incorporated that or how you obtained those opportunities while in medical school? Yeah. So actually the first research opportunity I had, I did an undergrad. My senior year, I worked doing undergraduate research at a cardiovascular department in the medical school of Temple University where I did my undergrad. And so I think that was a lot of like lab research. So I worked there for a year. So I got a lot of experience in the lab setting there. And that I really obtained because my institution had what they called an undergraduate research program. And basically you apply and then anyone who, any director of a project who's working on one and and is looking for volunteers is listed and you can contact them. They can contact you. They even have like a little social. So you kind of just pair up with them there and find someone through that. In terms of in my clinical years, honestly, my case report fell into my lap. I didn't really seek it out. And I feel bad when people ask me about it because I didn't really go out looking for it. But I was just working on the floors of the peds ward. So it wasn't even an internal medicine uh, case re- case report. It was pediatrics. It was basically just, we, I, we had an, a patient with an interesting presentation and it wound up being a rare disease that was discovered by the radiologist. So we, re- we just wrote the patient up and the attending was asking the residents to do it. And I asked the attending if I could join in and he was like, absolutely. And he was like, you can write the abstract, you can find the images and he just assigned me a role. So Right. I think what what really matters there is that you asked if you could be a part of it. Because you could have also not asked to be a part of it and never had anything to do with it. And so I want the IMGs that are listening to to remember that part. That even though the opportunity came up and sort of fell in your lap, you also made the conscious effort of asking to be a part of it. Because sometimes during clinicals, I've noticed students never are thinking about creating the initiative to start right? Like asking for that opportunity. I would really want that to be a cue for everybody listening to keep your eyes peeled for when you're rotating. When you see a chance to ask for an opportunity, do ask. And then, you know, like in your case, Caitlin, your attending was like, hey, yeah, you write the abstract, you do this, which is usually most physicians will assign you a role if you ask to help. But just like we're all well-meaning people, sometimes attendings are not thinking about overburning their students as well. So you need to consider that. If you want to do something, you may have to seek it out just a little bit. So yeah, I for, absolutely agree. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, that part of the story. Now, another thing I wanted to, to talk about is, you know, because people always ask me this when it comes to research, but I really just want to emphasize something about your story that stands out to me is, a lot of the bench research that you did was actually prior to medical school. And so I've had this question come to me before, hey, Dr. Loom, should I include my research experience before medical school? Can you touch a little bit on what your undergrad background was in and how your research tied into when you did the ERAS application? 
Yeah. So basically on my ERAS application, what I included versus didn't include was if I, if it contributed to making me a better doctor, then I included it. If it was skill sets that weren't really relevant, I left them off. But in terms of my research, so basically we worked with mice and the goal was to see if interleukin-19 uh, reversed atherosclerosis at all. So we were feeding the mice Western diets and then we would inject you know, half with IL-19 and half with control. And then at the end of the, I think it was the six week period, it's been a while, but I think it was six weeks, we would put the mice to sleep and we would dissect the aorta. And then we used a stati- statistical program to calculate the percentage of plaque in the aorta. So even though this was in mice, obviously atherosclerosis is very prevalent in the United States. So that's kind of how it ties into ERAS in general. Wow. Yeah. So, and I think I like that you shared that story because I really want people to hear that the experiences that you have prior to medical school do carry weight. And in some instances, we IMGs often think it has to be everything from M1 onward, when indeed there are so many things in your past that are clinically relevant to how you became a doctor and where you're going in your career. Because really when a program is reviewing that, all they're thinking is this person has some understanding of research or some understanding of medical lingo when it comes to interpreting research, that's really what's important, especially for the primary care specialties. So looking back at your journey, any particular advice that you would want to offer yourself looking back at this process? Oh, I don't know. I think let the people who doubt you fuel your fire, I think would be the best advice I have. I was rejected twice. I was told I wouldn't pass step one by an interviewer because my MCAT score was so low. I just feel like that's kind of what fueled my fire. So if you have, you know, any doubts, if you did poorly on the MCAT, if your GPA isn't as strong as you wanted it to be, or if you've taken gap years and you feel like it's going to take you a while to get back into the swing of things, uh, use that fuel as your, use that to fuel your fire. Don't let it make you doubt yourself. I agree a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. That's really good advice. Let that pain fuel your fire. How can an IMG connect with you? Because I know there's going to be several people that will want to connect with you. They want to know how you're doing through residency. They want to ask questions how they too can match into a university program for internal medicine. So can you walk us through where we can find you? Sure. So I have my Instagram account, which is what I feel like I'm the most active on, which my handle is at Prescription Fitness MD. And then I also did just recently start a YouTube channel. So that's also Prescription Fitness MD. And then I also have an email address you guys can contact me at, which is prescriptionfitnessmd at gmail.com. That's great. We'll have all your links as well in the show notes of this episode. So you can click, everybody listening, you can do a one click down in the show notes and you'll be redirected to all her social profiles and you can follow her journey and ask any other further questions that you may have. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to watch your journey and seeing all the way through from medical school all the way into the start of PGY1. And we wish you nothing but so much success. Thank you so much.